Uh, could you turn in your Bibles, please, to Numbers chapter 26? I feel like uh, I haven't been in the wilderness for years. <clears throat> so it's been months, uh, it feels like, that I've uh, been able to, uh, to bring a message um, on the wilderness wanderings. And uh, so uh, I'd like to take, take, up, uh, take that up again tonight. And uh, hopefully it won't be too much longer that we'll be in the wilderness. So Numbers chapter 26 and uh, verses 1 to 4. So beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Eleazar the son of Aaron the priest, saying... Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upward <clears throat> throughout their father's house, all that are to go to war in Israel. Moses and Eleazar the priest spake with them in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Take the sum of the people from 20 years old and upward, <clears throat> as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt. And we thank the Lord for the reading of his word. I'll just ask the Lord to bless our time, shall I? Father, we do thank you for <clears throat> the great encouragement this evening that we've received through these spiritual songs. And uh, Father, it's, uh, if for no other reason, it, it's been good to be here, uh, just to sing the hymns and to hear the choir. And uh, Father, be reminded of all of your blessings to us. Lord, we thank you for your word and we pray that uh, there might be something that would instruct us, encourage us, whatever our need might be. We look to you as we open the word tonight and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled tonight's message, <coughs> Preparing for Canaan. Preparing for Canaan. Um, I'm not really sure how long it was uh, when I last brought a message on this uh, subject, but <coughs> if you remember, we left the Israelites on the plains of Moab. Uh, now, the plains of Moab weren't actually in Moab. Uh, they were to the north of, the, of Moab, in, in the land that once uh, belonged to the Amorites. Um, and if you remember, uh, the Israelites fought against and conquered the territory previously inhabited by the Amorites. The Lord allowed them to, uh, to conquer the Amorite people. Uh, now, this was a massive area uh, on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, it was once the ruled by two Amorite kings, Bashan and Og. Not Bethshan, that's Bashan. Bashan, King Bashan and King Og were the Amorite kings that were conquered by the Israelites. Now, in our last visit, we saw um, the sad matter of Peor, where the people committed fornication and idolatry. And the net result of those sins was that 24,000 um, Israelites died in a plague that was sent by God. Chapter 26 records what happened straight after this disappointing affair. And we wouldn't be surprised if uh, after this uh, God sent this second generation of Israelites off into the wilderness for another 40 years just as he had their fathers. But thankfully, <coughs> uh, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and instead of sending them away, he began preparing them to enter Canaan. I wonder if you remember when Moses was honoured uh, to see the Lord pass by him. You could just see the back of the Lord, the back of God. And the Lord spoke to Moses as he passed by him. And this is what the Lord said about himself. The Lord, that's Jehovah, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Aren't you glad that we have a merciful and gracious God who forgives sins? Aren't you glad about that? 
Well, I'm sure the Israelites were. After the plague of Peor, the Lord spoke to Moses, Moses and Eleazar. And when the elders were called to the tabernacle, <coughs> I'm sure they were fearful of what, of what was about to happen. I can imagine their relief when they um, were asked simply to number the people. The Lord wasn't going to send them the way. The Lord wasn't going to send some other judgment. In fact, the Lord was going to prepare them to finally enter the land. They knew that to number the people was a preparation for entering the land. Uh, Let me just remind you of that after the plague in verse 1, that the Lord spake unto Moses and Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saying, Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and upwards throughout their father's house, all that are able to go to war in Israel. Now, um, all those that were able to go to war were the men. Sorry about that, girls. Uh, the, the Israelite army, the Israeli army today is full of men and women. Uh, but back in those days, only the men were allowed to fight. And uh, so the, 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 the Aaron and, and Eliezer were to, was to instruct the elders to take the sum of all the males, 20 years old and upward, uh, throughout um, the camp of Israel. And each tribe uh, would be responsible for their own counting. And so in verses 5 to 51, we see the numbering of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, we're not going to read through them all. (laughs) Thankfully, too many hard names there. Uh, But when the count finally came in, the first total given, and always first in line for all of these things, was the older brother. You know those older brothers our sisters, they, they always think that they should, uh, they're entitled in some way. Well, uh, well, Reuben is always first uh, because he was the older brother. And so when the, all the tallies came in, Reuben's, uh, Reuben's tally or total was given first. Uh, verse 5 to 7, Reuben, the oldest son of Israel, the children of uh, Reuben, Hanak, of whom cometh the family of the Hanakites, and Pulu, the family of the Pulites, now you can see why I'm not going to read it all. And Hezron, the family of the Hezronites, and Carmi, the, the family of the Carmites. These are the families of the Reubenites, and they that were numbered of them were 40 and 3,730. There were 43,730 males, 20 years old and uh, 20 years and older, uh, in the tribe of Reuben. And so, uh, that's a lot of males. Uh, just from 20 years old and upward. Uh, now, if we were to read down, we'd see the, the next count uh, given was that of the tribe of Simeon uh, and then of Gad, etc., etc., etc. And uh, Moses records for us all of the totals for the, the, ten, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, of course, Joseph, Joseph's descendants were divided into two tribes. Uh, so there wasn't a, a, a tally for Joseph, but there was a tally for Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, Joseph's two sons. And so because they divided um, up Joseph's tribe into two, we still had 12 tribes, not including Levi. Now the total number of all males 20 years old and over, uh, 20 years old and over in the 12 tribes is recorded in verse 51. So if you just like to flip over there, verse 51. These were numbered of the children of Israel, 600,000 and 1,730. So there were 601,730 males, 20 years old and upward, uh, in in the the camp of the Israelites, plus uh, the Levite males. Now, the Levite males, they were numbered differently. Uh, and we see, having seen the, the numbering of the 12 tribes, we have a look at the, uh, the separate numbering of uh, the Levites from verses 57 to verse 62. So let's just go down, uh, down the chapter to verse 57. And these are they that were numbered of the Levites after their families. families Of Gershon, of the family of the Gershonites, the, of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites, of Merari, the family of the Merarites. These are the families of the Levites, the family of the... Libite, uh, Libnites, the family of the Hebronites, the family of the Marlites, the family of the Mushites, the family of the Korathites, 
and Kohath hath, and Kohath begat Amram. Now, why was he giving us this little genealogy? Well, it goes on to explain, and the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt, and she bare unto Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam. Now, that was a significant family amongst the Levites. And under Aaron was born Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord. And those that were numbered of them that were twenty and three thousand. Sorry. And those that were numbered of them were twenty and three thousand. And the numbering is different. All males from them from a month old and upward. For they were not numbered among the children of Israel because there was no inheritance given them among the children of Israel. And so uh, the Levite males were numbered differently, uh, just from one month old and upward. And there were were 23,000 Levite males, one month and old, upward. 601,730 males, 20 years and older, in the 12 tribes, 23,000 of these younger males in the Levites. So that's a rather large number of people. And these were just the males of a certain age. Uh, these weren't the, the younger males. These weren't the females. Uh, so you can imagine that there must have been at least two million people or more uh, waiting to enter Canaan. Now Moses, having given us the numbering, the sum or the tally, he went on to make a point about these people that were included in the count uh, on that occasion. And he makes the point in verses 63 to 65. Let's just read those. These are they that were numbered by Moses and Eleazar the priest, who numbered the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho. Jericho was on the other side. Oh, no, Jericho was, uh, was on the, the other side of the river. But among these was not a man of them whom Moses and Aaron the priest numbered when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not a left a man of them, save Caleb, the son of Jephthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses makes a point at the end of this numbering, a point of telling us that there was not a man left who failed to enter into the land 40 years before. The only two males of that age who were Alive still was Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who had given the faithful report. Now we know how many men that was uh, who were not in this camp that died in the wilderness. And we know that from the previous count. So if you just put your little bookmark back there in Numbers 26 and go back to Numbers chapter 2. So we just remind you of how many men that was, a young men that was, before the 40 years in the wilderness. Numbers 2 and verse 32. These are those which were numbered of the children of Israel by the house of their fathers. All those that were numbered of the camps throughout their hosts were 600,000 and 3,550. Just before leaving Mount Sinai, This was the sum of those numbered of the children of Israel, the males, 20 years old and upward. All but two of these died in the wilderness over the 40 years of wandering. There were at least 603,548 graves scattered throughout the desert because of the unbelief of the people. And that's just the males. And this made me wonder how many graves there are in the world today of souls who are suffering in hell today because of unbelief. You see, unbelief, friends, (laughs) unbelief is the real killer because unbelief, the effects of unbelief, are for eternity. And so that's a a sobering thought uh, of the effects that unbelief can have even still today. Now, the reason for the numbering of the Israelite men was to determine the fair division of the land. It wasn't just so that they could say, oh, there's all those people. 
uh, this is the number. No, there was a purpose in the numbering. Uh, and so uh, we come back to uh, verse 52, back in Leviticus 26, and verse 52 to 56, we read of the division of the land. Numbers 26, 52, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Unto these the land, these, these 600 and uh, 1,730 men. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to the few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. Notwithstanding the land shall be divided by lot, According to the names of the tribes of their fathers, they shall inherit. According to the lot, shall the possession thereof be divided between many and few. And so, the land into which they were about to enter, the land would be divided into sections. And each section would be given to a tribe. And that, where, where they actually uh, would land up and where they would eventually uh, live was determined by the casting of a lot. Uh, the elders would come together and lots would be cast to determine which part of the land the, the tribe would, tribes would live in. Uh, now our word lottery comes from the word lot and so it gives you a bit of a, an idea of what a lot is. Now, I'm not sure what objects they chose to cast the lots. <clears throat> whether stones were thrown into a hat with the names of the various regions or straws, straws in the hand, you know, pick the shortest straw. I don't know how they chose it. I don't know what, what they used to, to cast the lots. But, but this method, method was used uh, to rule out uh, any skullduggery. Proverbs 18, 18 says, The lot causeth contentions to seize and parteth between the mighty. Um, now, I use this method of the lots all the time uh, when I'm, you know, working with or dealing with children. It's very biblical uh, what I do. I mean, who goes first? Who gets the last chocolate? <laughs> who bats first? <clears throat> we toss a coin, we roll a dice. It's left up to the lot to decide. And I can't be accused of favouritism. Uh, well, we'll just... Uh, and I do it when... I tell the children, pick a number between one and ten, and the closest one, well, that's who goes first. That's who gets to choose. That's casting of a lot. The various divisions of Canaan were somehow thrown into a hat, and the lot decided who lived where. But it would be also true to say that, especially in Old Testament times, people thought that the Lord had a hand in how the lots fell. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast in the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And so one author put it this way. This method was adopted not only in order to preclude jealousies and disputes, but also that the several tribes might regard the territories as determined for them by God himself. They believed that God had a hand in the lot, in the lot falling to this one or to that one. God wanted the Israelites to cast lots to divide the land. That way there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be um, arguments, there wouldn't be wars, it would be all according to lot. And I think um, God did this so that it would be fair uh, to all the tribes. And this attests to the justice of God. Deuteronomy 32.4 says, He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. God really does want fairness uh, in all of his works. And so God told them they had to decide by lot who would live where in the land. Another way God made it fair was to use the numbering to determine the size of the division each tribe would, uh, would receive. Have a look at verse 54 again. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be according to those that were numbered of him. There was to be an equality in the allocation of the land. 
The larger tribes were to receive more land, the, the smaller tribes were to receive less land. And so uh, now we know uh, all the, the tribes have, uh, have given their, the, the sum of the number uh, in each tribe, and so they'd be able to bring those, uh, those uh, sums to, the, to, to Moses and, and to Eleazar, and they will say, okay, you're a big tribe, you, you'll have to have a bigger area. Or you're a small tribe, you'll have to have a smaller area. In this way, it was fair for the individuals and the families uh, of Israel. God wanted there to be an equality in the allocation of the land. And this is still God's desire for us today who are his spiritual children. Just flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Apostle Paul was raising funds for the poor saints in Judea. There had been a drought right through uh, Judea, where Jerusalem was, Samaria, that part of, of uh, the Middle East. There had been a terrible drought, and the, the Christians there were suffering terribly. Uh, there were probably many of them were hungry. So Paul called on the saints of Greece and Asia to give generously to meet the need of the poor saints of Judea. And we read in verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, uh, that ye through his poverty may be, might be rich. And we're, we're, we really do thank the Lord for what he's done for us. Uh, but a bit like Pastor Crockett shared this morning, sometimes we, we leave that there and forget that and don't apply that in our own life with each other. And that's what Paul wants to remind them of. You've received the riches of God through the sacrifice of Christ. Well, we read on, verse 10, And herein I give my advice, for it is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be afforded a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it. They, the church in Corinth had promised to give toward this special fund for the poor saints in Judea. And so he, says, he said, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also of that which you have. For if there be at first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want that their abundance may also be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Now, this desire for communism, uh, for, for equality, isn't communism. Uh, it's not socialism. But what it is is pure religion and undefiled. This is pure religion and undefiled. Now, this is not forgetting those in God's house who have a need. Or it's convenient for us, as we were reminded this morning, to, to forget those who have needs. In other places, we can sort of, oh, well, just sort of be, you know, feel a bit emotional about it for a while, but then slowly but surely when we don't do anything, we just forget about it. The concept of equality isn't, isn't a political one, it's a biblical one. And it's the rule God wants us to apply in his house. If we are in the household of God, this is what, what he wants us to do. And this is the basic reason for our ministry to support children's homes in India. It's exactly the same principle that Paul gave and shared with the Corinthians. Our churches in Australia have an abundance. But the Indian churches have a want. And that word, they are wanting in it. They have need. And our Heavenly Father has blessed us with an abundance <laughs> so we can supply their need. We have the abundance, we have the ability to help them and he has given us that so that we might supply their need. He hasn't given it to us so that we might store it up in houses and build bigger barns and bigger barns and get wealthier and wealthier. He has blessed us with these things so that we might meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ wherever that need might be. What God wants in his house is an equality. That's not my word. That's God's word. And this was at the heart of God's plan for the division of Canaan for the 12 tribes. 
God wanted there to be an equality. So those tribes that had larger numbers got more land. Those tribes that had smaller numbers had less land. Fairness and equality. Well, that's how it was for the 12 tribes. But if we go back to Numbers 26, you probably already know that there was a different allocation of land for the Levites. It was very different. Just as the numbering for them was different, so to the allocation of the land. And so we go back to Numbers 26 and verse 62. We read this. And those that were numbered of them, this is the Levites, were 20 and 3,000 old males from, the, from a month old and upward, for they were not numbered among the children of Israel because there was no inheritance given them among the children of Israel. The 12 tribes were to live in their designated tribal regions. And I know you've probably all seen those maps of those, those uh, ancient days and you probably know now who was up in the north and who was down in the south and who was out on the coast and you get to know where the different tribal regions were. That was true for the 12 tribes, but the Levites were to have no separate tribal lands. Instead, they were to be given cities within each tribe. Just flip over to Numbers 35. Numbers 35. And verses 1 to 3. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possession cities to dwell in. And ye shall give also unto the Levites suburbs for the cities round about them. And in the cities shall they have to dwell in, and the suburbs of them shall be for their cattle and for their goods and for their beasts." Each of the 12 tribes were to provide cities for the Levites to dwell in. And so there were uh, Le- Levitical cities uh, in Reuben. There were Levitical cities in Simeon and in Manasseh and in Ephraim and in Judah and all the different parts of Israel. Each tribe were to have in, within their tribal region cities for the Levites. Not just cities, but suburbs pasture lands around each city. So they were given a a village or a city and they were given land around each city. Now, to ensure the Levites were properly catered for, uh, probably he didn't trust his own people to be generous. He probably thought, oh, we'll just give them the city and that's it. No. Um, The Lord prescribed how big the suburbs, the pasture lands around each city had to be. Have a look in verse 4 and 5 here. Uh, Leviticus 35, 4. And the suburbs of the cities, which he shall give unto the Levites, shall reach from the wall of the city and outward a thousand cubits round about. And ye shall measure from the without the city on the east side two thousand cubits, and on the south side two thousand cubits, and the west side two thousand cubits, and the north side two thousand cubits, and the city city shall be in the midst. There shall be to them this shall be to them the suburbs of the cities. Now it seems to be a little bit of a discrepancy there. They're to measure 1,000 cubits and then another 2,000, and I read that as being 3,000. Um, they were to have one boundary, 1,000 cubits around the village, perhaps so the village or the city could grow from a wall of each city. And added to that was another 2,000 cubits. One, one author said this. He said, the first 1,000 were for their cattle and goods, the two thousand for the other two thousand for their gardens, orchards, fields, and vineyards, and so the Jewish writers understand it. And so this seems to me to mean that there were they would have three thousand cubits as a boundary around each Levitical city. And that's about four thousand five hundred foot, about one point four kilometres around each village or city. A Levitical city was to be for the Levites, the city and its suburbs. Six of the Levitical cities were to be the cities of refuge, and you know all about those, but here it is, verse 4. Uh, sorry, verse um, uh, 6. Uh, and among the cities which he shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities of refuge, which you shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither, 
and to them he shall add 40 and 2 cities. So all the cities which shall he give to the Levites shall be 40 and 8 cities, them shall he give with their suburbs. So there were to be 48 Levitical cities spread right throughout Canaan. And uh, uh, six of those would be cities of refuge, uh, which the next few chapters actually speak about the rules for the cities of refuge. And the same uh, rule would apply for how many cities were to be allocated to the different tribes. There were 12 cities, uh, 12 tribes for 48 Levitical cities. Uh, but we read this in verse 8. The same rule would apply as to where they would be allocated. And the cities which he shall give shall be of the possession of the children of Israel. And from them that have many shall you give many. But from them that have few, ye shall give few. Everyone shall give of his cities unto the Levites according to the inheritance which he inherited. So uh, larger tribes would have, perhaps have a few more Levitical cities. Smaller tribes would have less. It's the same rule. It's the same rule of equality. Now I wonder if this, uh, if you, you can picture in your mind and now the different tribes and within each tribe there's some cities that are just for the Levites. And I wonder if, if this is a sort of a picture of the local church, the provision, it's a picture of the local church that God has provided for us. We who are, belong to God, we, we live in different places all around the world, but God has got placed all around amongst the various regions and cities and towns, uh, even of our country, he has local churches, local churches uh, to meet our spiritual needs. You see, the Levites had a direct role in running the tabernacle. They all would have to take, have shifts where they went in a certain times through the year to, to fulfil their responsibilities in the tabernacle. Sometimes they spend at home in the year, uh, the rest of the time was down in the tabernacle. Uh, but each Levite was responsible, to, had a direct role in the running of the tabernacle, so they had a spiritual and a civil role. They had a spiritual role as pastors, if you like, and they had a civil role as judges. Just turn over to the uh, book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. And verses 8 to 11. So Moses is uh, uh, sharing some, some more of the law. Uh, if there arise a matter too hard for thee to in judgment uh, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, being matters of contra- controversy within thy gates, then thou shalt arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire... And they shall show thee the sentence of judgment, and thou shalt do according to the sentence which, which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall, shall show thee, and thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee, according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, and thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand or to the left hand. The law of Moses was both a civil law and a religious law. Just like we have the law of Australia, uh, the law of Moses was their law, their civil law, but it was also their religious law. And so the Levites, the Levites were the arbiters or the the people responsible for making sure that the law was kept or that rulings were made in respect to the law. They were arbiters of the law. So when a dispute occurred between, in a certain place between uh, perhaps between neighbours or between uh, friends or between uh, relatives, when, when, a, when a dispute occurred, the parties involved didn't, didn't have to travel very far to get a ruling on their matter. They didn't have to go all the way to the tabernacle to seek out the priests. They could just go to their local Levitical city and seek a hearing. Uh, we're in Reuben and the nearest city in Reuben is just a couple of k's away, so let's go down there and let's go to the Levites in the city and tell them, uh, you know, lay out our, our dispute and let them 
judges according to the law. They were like the magistrates or the judges of Israel. And it was handy, if you like, to have all these Levit- Levitical cities uh, that were local and so that people didn't have to travel all the way to the tabernacle. But the same would apply also for the spiritual leadership of the people. For some, the tabernacle was miles away, days and days of walking. But the Levites were close at hand and they were there to teach the people God's law. And I thought that that was a kind of a picture of of the New Testament local church. And I'm very thankful that we don't have to go to the big smoke, (laughs) to the big city, to receive instruction from God's word. I think it's a blessing to have spiritual leadership that's local and because this is God's plan, that wherever his people are, he has local churches, just like those Levitical cities amongst the tribes of Israel to have spiritual leadership and to teach God's word. And so this is how God prepared the people to get into the land of Canaan. He had the people numbered and he gave instructions about land allocation now. You think that would be all pretty clear, but there were some people, some of the tribes, who wanted a change. And not only that, there was one particular family uh, who weren't happy about what they heard. And you'll have to wait till next time to see who they were. So let's uh, let's leave it there, and and uh, we'll uh, close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for way that you cared for your people we thank you for the way you provided for them we can see through all your dealings with your people that you were always just and right in your dealings and father you showed us that what what you want in your house you want us our lord to to be just and fair in our dealings and you want us also lord to 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 be a part of uh, lord that process of equality now, Lord, if, if we have more than we need, if we have an abundance, show us, Lord, where we can meet the needs of others. Lord, we thank you for our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.